I was accepting work release. And mind you, work release was made for people to go spend six months to maybe a year in so that you can reacclimate yourself to society because you was constantly monitored. They had, I was on what they called a five and two, which meant that five nights a week I stayed in society, but two nights out of every week I had to come back to the facility, drug tests, make sure I had no police contact or whatever. And like I said, it was only made for six, to, six months to a year. But I ended up spending four and a half years there for the simple fact that every time I went in front of a parole board, I was hit with two year, 24 month hit three times while I was there. And the reason they kept using for hitting me with 24 months was that I was a threat to society because of my charge. And I kept thinking, well, how am I a threat to society if I'm in the streets every day, how am I a threat to society? I, I didn't have no understanding to that either, you know, but every time I went in front of a parole board, I received 24 months. And the third time I went in front of the parole board, they hit me with 24 months, but this time they took work release from me. Well, I hadn't done anything for them to take the work release from me. I was working in a um, steel plant. My father had got me a job. I was actually bringing home more money than some of the guards that was, you know, guarding over me or however you want to say it, some of the correctional officers. I was bringing home more money than them. I was working in a steel factory. But they took all of that away from me when they took the work release and put me back in jail. I ended up going back to um, Collins Correction Facility, spending 14 months there while I fought because they had no right to take the work release from me. I eventually won that. And instead of them sending me back to the work release facility, because if they had sent me back to the work release facility, it would have opened up a floodgate for everybody that had charges like mine to be um, eligible for work release. So they took me to what they called an emergency parole board, and they gave me parole. Since then, and this was back in 1997, I believe, yeah, 1997, I received parole and came out on parole. I've been on parole ever since 1997. I've done nothing to go back to jail. I've, I've not had no violations. But living on parole is almost as bad as being back in jail. And I say that because you're out here, and, and there's so many things that you could do out here as a free person, but me being on parole, I can't indulge. There's a lot of things that go on out here that I would like to participate in that I can't partake in, be it because of my um, 9 o'clock curfew, being, I mean, it's just so many things out here that I'm not privy to, that I can't participate in. I can't, we, we, we right now, we getting ready to have a new president I can't vote. I can't vote for one. I can't, my voice is not being heard at all. You know, I ain't no telling, I, I don't even consider who I might want to vote for because I know I can't vote anyways. It's just, and it's hard to try to come up with all of it now, but there's just so many things out here now that I can't do. There was an incident one time that I was on um, Kensington Avenue and somehow my um, registration to my car had expired, of course, it's probably because I didn't pay it, whatever the case may be, it expired. And I was pulled over by the police. And it was a lady police officer. She pulled me over and she asked me for my license. I give her my license. She go back to her car and I guess type in my license numbers to the computer. And what came up with is that I'm on lifetime parole for murder. And within 60 seconds, there was nine additional cop cars surrounding me for no reason. I hadn't done anything, but she had called for backup. I don't know if because she was thought that I was some type of threat or anything or whatever the case may be. Nine additional police cars, and it was nothing before a traffic stop. And once they saw that, you know, I was on lifetime parole, whatever the case, they began to, you know, bother me in a, in a way that I kind of, I can't say I expected, but 
it wasn't in no real bad way, but things like taking a knife out and taking my license plates off my car and talking mess to me, you know, just because I was on parole, I was subject to a, not no brutal, no, no, no brutality, but verbal brutality I was just because of the fact that I was on parole. And I go through this here constantly. There's so many incidents I can sit here and tell you about that I have to go through because of my, me being on parole. You wouldn't believe, an average person wouldn't believe. You don't really understand what's really going on with people on parole until you're on it. Or people, what I say is that you, you, you couldn't possibly understand what I basically go through in my life because I'm going through it for something that I had nothing to do with. If I would have participated in the death of Mr. Crawford, I, would, I could justify all of the things that I'm going through to myself. I could say that, well, because I participated in his murder, this is why I'm being treated like this. This is why my life has been on hold. But when you know that you had nothing to do with it, there's no justifying it. There's no way I could justify my life now and the way I'm living my life because I had nothing to do with the crime in which I was sent to jail for. One of the, well, one of the biggest things, before I went to jail, I had a son. He was 33 days old before I went to jail. Now, he's a grown man, he has kids of his own, and I never had the opportunity to kind of like be a father to him. To, the, to this day, I treat him more like a friend of mine, more so than my son, because it's kind of difficult to come back after 30 some years and try to be a father to a child when you've missed all of his growing up, never had the opportunity to go to none of his school meetings, never had the opportunity to play catch ball with him or none of the things that a father would do with a son. I never had the opportunity to do this with my son. And he's 30 something years old today and I'm, I just don't know how to be a father to him. However, I've never been deep, a deeply religious person. I've always believed in a higher authority. I believe in God and everything, but I've never been very, very deep into it. But of recently, a lot of things have been happening to me that I don't know how to justify it. And I, I believe that it's God looking out for me. I keep saying, I, I, and I got down and I used to pray and I asked for two things. I asked for a child so that I can be a father to him and I asked that my case be overturned. I was blessed with one of the finest childs that I ever, a, ch a son. I have a one year old son now and if I had to sit down and wrote a letter to God and asked him for a son and told him what I want my son to be like. I couldn't have got a better son than I have now and I'm so happy that now I'm able to be a father and I try to be the best father that I ever know. And I, I grew up, I had one of the best fathers that, I had the best father. And I'm trying to be that there for my son and I believe God answered my prayer as far as having a child. And within my heart, I believe that God's going to also answer my prayer and have my case overturned.